So welcome to this uh, Theory from the Margins uh, Zoom webinar with Professor Paul Gilroy and Ruth Wilson Gilmore about their edited volume, Selected Writings on Race and Difference, published uh, in April this year by Duke University Press in the Selected Writings of Stuart Hall series. My name is Sindra Bungstad. I'm a research pref professor at Kiefel, the Institute for Church, Religion and Worldview Research. And with me as uh, fellow co-panelists uh, from Theory from the Margins today are uh, Associate Professor Bodhisattva uh, Chattopadhyay from the University of Oslo, uh, Christian Soraya batman Jelici, also from the University of Oslo, and our specially invited panelist, uh, Dr. Louisa Olufsen lane who is uh, an uh, postdoctoral fellow uh, at the Department of English at the University of Oslo in Norway. Uh, in the theory from the margins collective, we are extremely pleased and honored to have Professor Gilroy and Professor uh, Gilmore with us uh, to discuss their mentor and friend, the late founding father of cultural studies, uh, Professor Stuart Hall. Uh, in an essay in the volume under discussion today, the 1996 Why Fanon, uh, the late Stuart Hall writes about the importance of engaging the afterlife of Franz Fanon rather than trying to capture the truth about Fanon. And in another essay in this splendid volume that we are discussing today, the 1992 uh, CLR James, a portrait, Hall writes that major intellectual and political figures are not honored by simply celebration. Honor is accorded by taking his or her ideas seriously and debating them, extending them, quarreling with them, and making them live again. So then, in the very spirit of the late and great Stuart Hall, 1932, to uh, 2014, we will in this Zoom webinar engage Hall's writings on race and difference with a specific view towards what we may learn from Hall's massive oeuvre in the present and across academic disciplines. Of our two invited guests today, it may truly be said that they do not require any introduction at all. But for short then, Professor Paul Gilroy is Professor of Race and Racialization at the University College London, UCL, uh, and Director of the Sarah Parker Riemann Center for the Study of Race and Racialization. An erstwhile doctoral student of Halls at the Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies, or the CCS, at the University of Birmingham in the UK in the late 1970s, early 1980s, Gilroy uh, has held professorships at Yale, the London School of Economics, King's College, London, and UCL. Among his seminal con contributions to scholarship is his 1987, There Ain't No Black in the Union Jack, the 1993, The Black Atlantic, Modernity and Double Consciousness, his 2000 Against Race, Imagining Political Culture Be Beyond the Color Line, and the 2004 After Empire, Melancholia or Convivial Culture. A fellow of the British Academy, the American A Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the holder of honorary doctorates from Sussex University, Goldsmiths College, and the University of Liège in Belgium, Gilroy was awarded the 2019 Holberg Prize from the University of Bergen in Norway. And given that that's my alma mater in, in Norway, uh, there are many of us, I think, who remember uh, that experience, the Holberg Week with Professor Gilroy with uh, particular fondness. Professor Ruth Wilson Gilmore is the director of the Center for Peace, Culture and Politics and professor of geography at the City University of New York. She is known in the US and elsewhere as a, a prominent prison ab abolitionist and prison scholar uh, with a number of seminal contributions to the study of uh, carceral, carceral geography, including her 2007 uh, Golden Gulag, Prisons, Sur Surplus, Crisis and op Opposition in uh, Criminalizing, in Globalizing California, 
uh, which was published by uh, California University Press. Gilmore is an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and received the 2020 Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Association of Geographers. So um, a few words uh, before I leave the floor uh, to Professor uh, Gilroy and Professor Gilmore uh, about the proceedings of today's uh, Zoom webinar. We start out with an introduction to uh, this fine volume, uh, Selected Writings on Race and Difference by Stuart Hall, published by Duke University Press, from uh, Professor Gilmore and uh, Gilroy. Uh, we then proceed to uh, questions from our invited panelists and then uh, towards the end to questions from the audience. Now, with regard to your questions uh, from the audience, uh, you should feel free, absolutely free to start submitting questions via uh, chat uh, immediately. Uh, I can't promise that we'll manage all the questions, but we'll do uh, our best to uh, to uh, select a sample, a representative sample of, of the questions you pose via chat. So without further ado, I then uh, give the floor uh, to our distinguished guests, Paul Gilroy and Ruth Gilmore. All right, um, I'll start. Thank you, Sindra Bonstad. Thank you, colleagues in Norway. Thank you, Paul Gilroy, my friend and colleague and comrade. And thank you to the hundreds of people who are tuning in for this webinar today. I will say a few words um, to start and then Paul Gilroy will say a few words and then we will uh, eagerly engage the conversation with the panelists and with the audience. In the late 1980s, Hazel Carby's Reconstructing Womanhood introduced the Southern California Reading Group to the Birmingham Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies. She wrote in her acknowledgments, for his rigorous intellect, political acumen, and theoretical insights, and for being the best teacher I ever had, I am indebted to Stuart Hall. Now, we in the reading group never doubted the continuity and interplay among campaigns for justice, community-generated inquiry, and informal and organized education, including university training. But craving fresh insights, we read newer texts in areas such as Black feminist theory, writers such as Hazel Carby, to challenge what we thought we already knew. Keen interest in pedagogy sparked by encounters with Paulo Freire and aberration for Carby and others militant learning made us curious. And we became particularly curious about Hazel's best teacher at the center. It wasn't easy to find Stuart Hall's publications in the USA in the late 1980s. My partner Craig Gilmore, then a bookseller, came up with a few titles. Race, Articulation, and Society Structured in Dominance, published in a UNESCO volume. Later, The Hard Road to Renewal. And soon thereafter, Hall's Lecture in Marxism and the Interpretation of Culture. So that's where we began. At first, we had a hard time saying what excited us so much. Hall's writing combines patient grounding with radiant analysis and recapitulates objectively and subjectively a project's layered setting. That is, attentive to the conditions of production and use of its constituent elements, each intervention's topics, methods, evidence, and explanatory procedures add up to an achievement that is stubbornly concrete yet exceeds its immediate design. The actions that cohere in and as compositions suggest to readers how to do something else. Capturing our imaginations, these qualities also, in the short run, thickened our tongues with awe. 
Much later, we realized our insight turned out to be A, if not B, central lesson. Stuart Hall's work models social theory as action. It's a guide for, guide for thinking about, analyzing, understanding, and organizing to change distinct but densely interconnected geographies of what he described as the global maldistribution of material and symbolic resources. Therefore, against any flat insistence that specificity arises from fractures and partitions necessitated by justice, the particular tendencies in these pages underlie the ongoing urgency of expansive politics, including what, perhaps for want of a better word, we still persist in calling internationalism. Although full of questions back in the late 80s, we hadn't been idle. While Mandela was still in prison, militant intellectuals gathered from the North and South, including delegates from COSATU, the ANC, and the CPSA, to debate the trajectories and challenges of anti-capitalist, anti-racist solidarity under the rubric, Pan-Africanism Revisited, Liberation Movements in Africa and the Diaspora. Meanwhile, I researched and drafted texts for a Writers and Readers documentary comic about Anglophone, North American, and Caribbean Black writing mostly fiction. That project, 400 Years of Attitude, Black Literature for Beginners, which really should have been titled 500 Years of Attitude, Black Literature for Beginners, explored the structures of feeling through and against which writers crafted stories about becoming and remaining free. As an excursion into concrete determinants and multiple definitions of possibility, 500 Years also looked at how readers came to the text covers, publishers, literacy, subscriptions, appeals, ink, paper, distribution. We held popular education sessions with the LA8, seven Palestinians and one Kenyan accused under a peculiar law in the United States that was designed to identify and deport communists from post-war USA. And no matter what, we fought tirelessly in local and broader campaigns while always trying to learn more. So this is the context in which I and others had the idea that a collection of Hall's writing would be a vibrantly useful thing for organizers in our corner of the planet to have. I talked it over with the late great Glenn Thompson, who was one of the founders and the editor of Writers and Readers. And Glenn agreed with me that uh, a volume of Stewart's work made available to a broad readership um, would be a good thing. So he committed some resources from Writers and Readers. Um, most of you who know Writers and Readers know the uh, Four Beginners series. And um, let me buy airplane tickets to go and meet Stuart Hall. So I first flew to Columbus, Ohio, and met him at a symposium there. In fact, met him in the elevator in the hotel where we stayed. And I explained to him as we went up the lift to the, our floors why I had, um, as it were, stalked him there to talk to him about a book. And then subsequently, we discussed the book at a cafe in Champaign at the big cultural studies blowout in April, I think it was, of 1990, which is where and when. Paul and I met for the first time face to face. And finally, I went and spent two glorious days in Stuart Hall's kitchen in Kilburn, talking with him about the many texts that he had in fifth and sixth and tenth generation Xeroxes on all different sizes paper with different clarities of typescript um, that he would bring to the kitchen and we would sit and talk about. and. Um, and, and uh, try to imagine into a book. One of the key concepts that I came away with, a word that I would never have used willingly or voluntarily before this adventure of many years of getting to know Stuart Hall and Stuart Hall's work is the word conviviality. I thought when I started out that it was a kind of weak thing that I shouldn't worry about instead of the goal of all of this agitation. In Hall's texts, thinkers gather 
to talk over specific problems, not to prove points already confirmed. It's fantastic how in his text, the topic that prompts the inquiry inspires us to notice aspects of it we otherwise might ignore because we're thinking categories together differently, stretching even in the analytical project, geometrically discontinuous, politically articulable places. That is, actually existing activity is both the object of analysis, this article or lecture or talk on the radio or television is about activity acts, and also the occasion to assemble activity, to coordinate thinkers whose topics might differ, but whose commitments also have developed in the dynamic context of capitalism, saving capitalism from capitalism. The through line, perhaps unsurprising in a recovering student of Henry James, explores consciousness as firm and tentative habits of becoming rather than aggregated effects of experience. The writers Hall talks with aren't random, while their analytical approach is sometimes distracting those studied by resolute anti-sectarianism. Their presence gently destroys any implication that specificity might be a tidally self-contained unity of time, place, and action. Instead, the object of analysis is prized open by practitioners whose own development and movement through the grand oppositional epic of capitalist modernity, which is to say all of racial capitalism to poor, demonstrates how specificity perpetually opens rather than partitions thought about the world by making the familiar strange, which is to say, provocatively alien. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ruthie, and uh, uh, thank you, everybody. Let me echo Ruthie's appreciative uh, words at the beginning of her um, presentation. Uh, I, I just want to say a little bit about this particular book and uh, our selection of the essays. I, I think one thing that we, in the spirit of what Ruthie's already said, we had determined that we would do is to offer um, an opportunity to engage with Stuart's writing and his voice, which accented his capacities, his extraordinary capacities as a teacher and a practitioner of a kind of wide uh, political pedagogy. And that's one of the reasons why so many of the essays in this book, the pieces in this book are drawn from uh, practical situations, political meetings, different public uh, events and um, uh, uh, congregations really um, and I wanted the, the voice the spoken voice to be something that came across very clearly in the book we decided that that was important and I, I hope that we've succeeded with that uh, there are, there's there's also I think a number of other things that are worth just mentioning before we go into the next phase of our meeting today I think <clears throat> There's a sense in which organizing the uh, material in the way that we have challenges a kind of implicit uh, periodization of Stuart's work and his thinking, which if it's, um, I mean, you know, the sources of this don't matter, but it, it seems to be a sort of story that runs from Jamaica through Oxford into the new left and then from the new left into the uh, via CCS into the Open University and thence to um, you know, Rivington Place and an argument about immersion in art and uh, culture as um, as the last phase of his writing and publication comes. And, and, and I think, you know, there's always a grain of something important in the way that that narrative is periodized. Um, but I, I think we, we wanted, I think I can say this, that we wanted to, to sort of trouble that periodization a little bit. And that we felt that uh, by bringing the work on um, against racism, about race, about um, uh, the politics of racial hierarchy, its relations, its connections with nationalism, British nationalism, with forms of authoritarian populism, forms of statism. Um, we wanted to we wanted to trouble that periodization by by drawing out those themes, and I suppose the the motivation for that is really the idea that um, 
how can I put it, that there's something about his continued return to an engagement with questions of racial hierarchy, uh, uh, anti-racism, race, uh, I don't like to use the word identity, these themes anyway in in the work. There's something about the continuing visitation of those themes, the continuing uh, return, iterated return to an engagement with these things, which might, in a different light, tell you something about how Stuart's other theoretical contributions um, develop in, in the ways that they do. And I think for me, that's really, uh, what is that really about? It's about fighting your way into and out of Marxism in a very distinctive uh, trajectory. And and I, th- and I think that was important to us because of the way that the more contemporary politics of these questions is generally is generally enacted. So there are some there are some questions about that. Perhaps we'll get onto that that later. We wanted really to see how that consistent engagement with the problem of race as hierarchy, as ideology, coloured and shaped his wider perspectives on the politics of culture and it, in particular the critique of Marxism especially with regard to the formation and reproduction of the authoritarian state in populist politics so that's that and now there are a couple of other things I want, I want to say I mean yes yeah, Stuart definitely um, um, you know a student of Henry James and that helps us to understand some of those transitions and pivots he's also somebody who at one time wanted to be a medievalist so there's another there's another question there about you know what what Tolkien was teaching him in Oxford um, which probably is for another occasion um, and lastly and this is a harder thing to talk about and because I don't I don't know the answer to it um, but it helps to explain why you know Ruthie's overture and initiative you know so long ago um, has taken so long to, to appear and that is that I think when I when I first met Stuart in the late 70s a book was listed of his essays and it was called reproducing ideologies and Macmillan were going to publish it. And you know, there was a lot of scurrying, anticipatory scurrying around and hoping to find this book, which just never ever appeared. So I think there's something there about, about the, the pattern of his publications um, and the priorities which we might interpret from the particular um, formation of those publications, which is relevant to this as well. And 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 it and I think it, you know, it's in a sense, it's it's probably necessary but not quite sufficient to say that that it's um, a feature of this commitment to the conjunctural to the to the intervention to the movement that is that's part of it but i don't know if if that's a sort of sufficient account really so i think you know there's something interesting there and that that sort of patterning of publications means that there's maybe a lot of translation to be done the these days, a lot of translation, a lot of salvage work to be done on making these texts and ideas come alive in a situation where it would be, if an ungenerous reader was to um, stumble into this, it would be all too easy to suggest that they they belong to a world that's left us. I mean, my sense as we began to put these texts together and think about their ordering and think about their clustering and so on was that there was there's really so much here that is of enduring relevance to the um the the, the persistent and the in, apparently intractable politics of, of of race and nation and authoritarianism and populism in the moment that we inhabit so i think le- let's try as we develop our discussion to, to turn towards those texts and, and and make them speak to our present, to our conjuncture, which you know is not is not is not the one in which the texts were produced, but but which is still um, connected sufficiently connected to make them especially valuable. And I'm thinking here, of course, about the impact of the digital world on on these political questions. And you know, Stuart certainly towards the end of his life was someone who was not very keen on uh, the digital anything. Uh, I think, well, I think his ghost Twitter account survives oddly um, seven years after his passing. So, uh, I, I, you know, I think there's a, there's a bigger set of questions about what politics itself has become in that period, which means that we have to work a little harder with these texts to make them really resonate with the moment that, we, that we're in at the, right now. So that's what I wanted to add. Thank you.
So thank you very much uh, for uh, these introductions, uh, Professor Gilmore and, and Gilroy. Uh, I now turn to our first panelist, uh, Dr. Louisa Ulufsen uh, Lane. Uh, and in connection, I, I, I forgot to mention uh, an important uh, part of her academic uh, training and background. Uh, Dr. Lane is, in fact, uh, one of extremely, uh, Norway's extremely few uh, Caribbean studies scholars. So, Louisa, by way of introducing yourself, you're also welcome to tell us a little bit more about, uh, you know, the kind of work that you do uh, as far as your own academic work is concerned before you proceed to your first question. Thank you. Yes, thanks for the introduction. So, I wrote my a PhD about Lincoln Kwesi Johnson in Oxford. Now I'm doing a postdoc where I'm looking at uh, the Harlem Renaissance and how the Harlem Renaissance uh, challenged distinctions between high and low culture. So I guess kind of the kind of thread running through my interests are the relationship between literature, politics, and music. I would say just to summarize, but also generally the relationship between aesthetics and politics and how especially writers of the African diaspora um, kind of negotiate the kind of complex formal aspects of politics and also how politics kind of feed into formal experiments such as sound or sound system culture or jazz. So that kind of leads to my question. Uh, to Professor Gilroy, um, and that is a question about Stuart Hall's writing about culture, uh, because Stuart Hall wrote about popular culture, subculture, and counterculture quite a while before this was common in academia. Uh, but I would like to hear a little bit more about how you perceive the kind of role of popular culture within his larger body of work. So how does his writing about popular culture fit into his fear about race and hegemony? But also, do you think his interest in popular culture reforms was shaped by his Jamaican and Caribbean background? And if so, in what ways do you think it kind of led him to pursue some of those themes? Thank you, thank you, Louisa. Um, very interesting line of question here, which I'm afraid I'm, I'm sort of really incapable of answering. I think, you know, obviously, the, the book that um, Stuart Hall wrote with Paddy Wannell, The Popular Arts, is a place where you can begin to uh, answer those questions. With, reg with regard to this volume, I think um, we, we didn't include uh, the text, uh, What is this Black in Black Popular Culture? Which, which I think also is something that would would give you um, would give you an answer, a slightly different answer than the one you might find um, than the one the one that might you, that you'll find in the popular arts. I, I think you know the the simple answer would really be to do with um, would be to do with questions of um, of, of Gramscian. Um, theory and what Gramscian theory becomes in Hall's hands and what it how it speaks to arguments about class and culture and reproduction and gender um, but not really race particularly or racism particularly in the volume um, um, resistance through rituals which is a very very important one I think for me as a, as a student because one of the things that made me want to go and, and study in um, in Birmingham I think that it's hard to talk about this because it, as it really relates to questions of generation and politics. And, you know, I think Stuart Hall is, was known for saying that he wasn't post-colonial, he was colonial. And I think that if we, if, we, if we follow the official story of his life, we understand that, you know, he left Jamaica a very, very long time before sound system culture and um, reggae and any of these things were even, were even part of life. Um, in 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 the in the island. Never mind um, 
parts of life in the island that reached into the kind of world that had produced him. So, so I think we have to be awfully careful about, about the history here and about how that history is con constructed. And to really answer your question, we'd have to place Hall's work in dialogue with a number of other uh, Caribbean uh, scholars and critics and thinkers, um, most obviously someone like Rex Nettleford, um, and, and, and start to really write the lives in counterpoint. So I don't, I don't really have an, a, a, a simple answer about this. I mean, how does interest in popular culture forms written into the, into the larger body of work? Well, the Gramscian story, which is really one that's alive on the, on the right now, is that um, politics is downstream from culture. We can boil it down to the Breitbart motto. Um, and that's something I think it's, it's a shame that the left's lost its grip on that particular insight. Um, do I think... The Jamaican background shaped his interest in exploring those topics. Well, it must have done. But I mean, if you think about the published work, for example, um, the, the text here, which is called um, uh, Africa is Alive and Well in the Diaspora, it's an important text because it's one that came out of, of Hall's work with UNESCO. Um, and, and, and that for me is one of the earlier uh, places where these questions begin to kind of inform a larger set of arguments. Um, that's really all about religion. And it's really, you know, I know Sindra and others will know much more about this than I do, but it's really sort of Simpson and the, the history of anthropological writing about religion, which is being engaged from a certain set of, of critical angles is being brought out and, and, and judged as wanting. So, so I think it's significant to me that where those things enter in Hall's published work, they enter really through an argument about black religion. And there, I suppose we'd also have to, you know, this is, I think is actually rather characteristic of a certain kind of phase in the development of black academic life. I think of, um, you know, St. Clair Drake's work on, on the redemption of Africa and black religion. This is the place that people went to, to find those arguments and to make those arguments. And we can reconstruct that as a movement within thought that speaks to a wider set of um, uh, interpretive um, gestures about, about the nature of the diaspora, I think. Um, you know, obviously that in the Brazilian context, and I know that Stuart knew that literature well, because I remember when we were in Brazil and the newspapers greeted him as the Pope of Cultural Studies, I always like to remember that moment, um, that it was clear from the conversations that were beginning to come out there that that this was uh, literature he knew very, very well, Freire and, um, and Bastide and so on. So I think you'll you will find an, an answer there. In the, this book, there's also the the Calypso essay, which I think is is really important because it reminds you of where to place him, generationally speaking. It reminds you that um, that the ability to understand those particular cultural habits as things that were endowed with value, things that were endowed with a political resonance, was perhaps not necessarily. There's always a, a lag, isn't there? There's always a kind of interpretive lag in, in, in this because so much of the time it's easier to take those things for granted, you know. Um, and and I think so. So I would say, uh, as a as a reader of Hall's work, that that actually it was really only maybe, you know, through contact with people like Dick Hebdige and some of the other people who were interested in Caribbean culture on its travels that he was able to, you know. Um, engage it in the in the way that you're talking about i don't i don't know that was something that was coming out spontaneously um or from from his own interest as an academic or a scholar and i think that in in the as it were um biographical narratives that we have of him it's clear that his tastes and interests and habits were very very wide um in the transition between oxford and um chelsea college and from there into in into uh into the center for cultural studies Ruthie, do you want, do you want to add anything to that? If, if I may, um, one of one of the uh, essays that um, Stuart gifted to me in the kitchen in Kilbourne was a very ancient, of hundredth generation Xerox copy of Africa is Alive and Well, and my jaw dropped when I read it. Um, I read it that night. I read it and reread it and reread it and reread it. And and uh, that was the one essay I was the keenest to have in this book, no matter what else we put in, <laughs> was that one. And the reason that I found it so, um, and still find it so irresistible and such a model 
not a not a structure, a model for thinking things, is um, the way that 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 Stuart Hall um, is uh, so attentive to um, Rastafarian religion as a rehearsal of freedom. So it itself is an interpretive gesture, interpreting from a script that was made available, which is part of the Bible, um, in order to think about small Z Zion beyond. And that then the essay itself is an interpretive gesture about the interpretive gesture, in which he steps back and, and looks at you know, what was happening in Jamaican politics, formal politics at the time, but constantly going back and forth. Uh, in such a way that we could see and feel aspiration on the part, not only of the people, the figures, the Rasta uh, people in the story, but also in how the story is put together in such a way that Hall is very mindful of and modest about the fact that he's stepping into footprints that were left by Cabral in an earlier iteration of UNESCO. Uh, compilations. Thank you. That's really that's uh, that's really helpful. I have a lot to <laughs> think about now. Um, I also have a question for Professor Gilmore, which is also about culture, <laughs> but from a slightly different angle. It's more about the study of culture in general, uh, because. Uh, I'm thinking sort of the COVID pandemic have uh, made a lot of people more aware of science. You know, there's like this kind of popular science popping up in newspapers, people following the vaccines, you know, there's kind of, it seems like people who haven't really been engaged in scientific questions are now kind of being exposed to it and following it. So the value of science, people are becoming more aware of the value of, the value of science and on the other hand, the killing of George Floyd mobilized these demands for reforms and structural change. And I think, you know, both events are kind of life and death questions. They're very sort of real, urgent, material, material physical crisis. So what do you think the role of culture and the study of culture has in the contemporary moment? Do you think that more people will see the study of culture as a as a kind of luxury or as something that will continue to be seen as necessary? That's a great question, thank you. Um, and my answer, my short answer is yes. And I know you, you gave an either or, and I'm quite serious in saying the answer is yes. Um, is the study of culture a luxury? Insofar as us having lives that are not interrupted, by premature, which is to say preventable death, it seems like life and death becomes luxurious to we who fight for it. So that's the first thing I wanna say without trying to be cute or clever. Um, but then the question is, what does the study of culture mean? And I think that um, Paul Gilroy and um, Stuart Hall in this volume and in so many other um, of his works um, has looked time and time again at the you know, materiality of culture in a variety of situations. So does it mean then that the study of culture must be instrumental for realizing some kind of alleviation of oppression the next morning after the study is done? Of course not. Does it mean, however, that um, kind of in the spirit of CLR James's um, insistence that uh, I think he was ripping off Trotsky when he said, uh, revolutions happen because people are so conservative. They wait and they wait and they try every little thing until one day people come out in the streets and clear up in the matter of years, of, of, of days, the dis disorder of centuries, right? So try every little thing, in my view, includes we try, we make culture 
We try culture, whether it's high or low, whether it becomes massified or remains in the popular. And we think about it. And, and all of that trying is part of the process. Is it all equally um, toward life? Of course not. Is some of it um, going to uh, kind of fall with the weight of style that has no substance? And of course it will. But the study of culture, in my view, to go back to what Paul Gilroy said in Invoking Gramsci, um, is the study of consciousness. It's the study of ideology. It's the study of how we understand ourselves in the world. And certainly, um, uh, Stuart writes in, I think it's one of the essays in um, Hard Road to Renewal that we don't have in this volume, but he says, you know, sometimes it's hard to tell which conjuncture we're in. Like, it's just hard to tell. And the study of culture and, and its practices, including what old stuff comes back to seem meaningful and resonant in, in a particular um, moment, helps us understand. It helps us see things we otherwise wouldn't see. I'd like to say that I think that Stuart Hall was an everythingist. And I mean that with the highest possible praise. And I identify with everythingism. And this book, which made it possible, this is Policing the Crisis for people who can't, don't have cameras. Uh, this book, Policing the Crisis, made it possible for me to think the things that were happening in the United States and beyond in a, a, a richness and diversity of approaches, what we might call interdisciplinary approaches, um, such that we could see very clearly that in order to stop this, we had to change everything, meaning understand so many different kinds of things, including culture. And I want to say one other thing about culture before we pass the microphone to our next um, uh, participant. And that is, uh, I think that in the current day, to go back to the question of digital and digitalization, it's hard to tell what is anyway popular culture and what is mass culture. That distinction used to be relatively easy to make. Ah, oh, the culture industry lifts things up and massifies them and sells them back to consumers. That's the mass culture part. And popular culture, although it overlaps, mass culture is something else. Well, now with the self-generated capacity in TikTok and Twitter and all these things I don't do, but I hear about, it's hard to say what is what. I mean, the industrialization lurks behind. You know, people theorize about all of the um, uh, the labor that's donated to, you know, the, the tech companies that then sell it back to us uh, and so on and so forth. We, we know those things. That is part of culture, but I just want to emphasize that I don't think we should ever be satisfied to think that whatever is the latest modality of interaction is what culture is. That we have, there are these layers and layers and layers, whether we're looking at religion, we're looking at expressive culture, we're looking at visual culture, the lively arts, which is something I've been obsessed about lately. Um, culture absolutely matters, not only for us to understand, but it's the purpose of struggle anyway, so that we can live these lives of voluptuous pleasure. So with that, it's time to uh, give the microphone to uh, Kristin Soraya Batman Jelici, who is with us today from Detroit, Michigan. So on a completely different time zone, like like Professor Gilmore. But the same, I think, as Ruthie, right? Um, good afternoon, everyone. I just wanted to say before I ask my questions, happy Eid al-Fitr or Eid Mubarak to everyone who is celebrating that today. Um, and if I, could, I could piggyback off of Luisa's question uh, to Ruthie. I know that we're talking about Stuart Hall, but forgive me. I want to talk to Ruthie about her work in large part because I started hearing more of her name in Iranian studies. Um, and I was 
I was pleasantly surprised about this. Um, and a lot of it has to do with, there was a book published by a, name, a man named Behrouz Bouchani, um, uh, No Friends with the Mountains. And he talks about his, his time on Manus Island. And if you guys can hear some screaming, it's my daughter in the other room who wants to be in this room with me. So I apologize for that. But anyhow, um, I, my question has to do with the, this ongoing conversation that is in Iranian studies with regards to, you know, among scholar activists. And I saw this on the Jadalia website. And one of the main questions that these scholars were talking about was, can and should the call to abolition um, to, sorry, the call to, uh, uh, to abolish or to abolish prisons be a global one? Um, and they, of course, highlighted Ruthie's work as inspiring the conversation on the prison abolition movement um, and how the concept of carcerality emerges in con the contemporary Iranian context among its many social institutions. Um, if I may, Ruthie, I'd like to take this opportunity to ask for your comments on what Golnar Nikpur discussed regarding abolitionist models of scholarship activism, which are emerging out of a primarily American context given the legacies of slavery and anti-Blackness. And if the political education of the abolition movement has been largely based on these particular experiences, what are the kinds of real, what real suggestions do you have for those who are keen to pursue efforts elsewhere around the globe, the effort to eradicate prisons and to promote the idea that, as you say, life, life is indeed precious when US exceptionalism in the movement is so endemic. So if you can comment about that, that would be wonderful. I don't think we can hear you, Ruthie. I think you're muted. I was, sorry, sorry. Thank you for that. I was just being modest. Um, but I, I wanna go back to this, policing the crisis. So um, three points. First one, take away for everybody who's going to leave this webinar early. Abolition, contemporary abolition actually means change everything. It doesn't mean let's figure out how to end something that seems to be uh, the ghost of um, African slavery in the United States. It's change everything, everything, everything. That's the first thing. And many, many people have been working really hard to, um, let me pick, pick up from you, de-exceptionalize a certain uh, reductive, um, uh, ridiculously reductive notion of what the anti-carceral actually is. Now, I'm gonna say a little more about this because this is what I learned to think, thinking with Stuart Hall's work. The first one is that um, the kinds of categories in which we come to understand ourselves and one another seem so often because of their specificity to be natural and durable and ones that have to be asserted no matter what. So in many instances today, not only in the United States, but elsewhere, um, around the planet, and I talk to people all over the planet, all the time, um, certain uh, forms of uh, group, I, group differentiation, let's say, um, seem to stand in for complete political experience and consciousness and aspiration. So, I said that in a very abstracted sense so that I can now say more um, concretely, that means that in the kind of form that this sort of thinking has um, uh, spread in the English speaking world, but not exclusively, um, many people imagine and assert the reality, which I think is false, that if you are black, you will have certain understandings. If you are Iranian, you will have certain understandings and so forth. And the best that can happen with all of these understandings is they can line up next to each other like militaries who are poised to go after a common enemy. I think that this is very bad politics. And the good politics that I get from this guy 
has to do with, as I said in my introductory um, remarks, what some of us still call internationalism. Maybe it needs a new word. Maybe it needs a new word. Um, maybe I'm kind of resonating a little bit with the, um, uh, with the earlier question about culture in saying that many of many aspects, institutionalized aspects of cultural production and reproduction, and here I'm including universities, including think tanks, including publications and so forth, whether they're mainstream or not, is um, to uh, kind of refresh and reinforce a sorting and stacking machine that keeps us completely broken apart, which is to say they are carceral in their design. Whether we're talking about borders, about race, about um, you know, various uh, forms of differentiation. And then the last thing I'll say, I could talk about this all day, but the last thing I'll say right now is that uh, a group of us, some of whom are probably tuned in now, uh, have been working a long time, it's been slow writing, uh, on a, an international, internationalist abolition statement to make crystal clear the kinds of things that have just been said. So the people who are writing into this one statement are based in South Africa, in Brazil, uh, Canada, the United States, people are dotted around Europe, but from various parts of the world. And we're in dialogue with people who are anywhere from the Pakistan, Afghanistan border to Delhi and, and uh, uh, Kerala and beyond. So what comes the clearest at the end of the day or at the dawn of the next day is what I prefer, is that the carceral is the problem for which abolition is the solution. And the only way to realize abolition is to uh, understand it as life in rehearsal, which Paul's essays exemplify, in my view. They, they exemplify. So whether or not the word abolition appears once in this book, and I think it probably doesn't, this is an abolition text because this is life in rehearsal. And we could talk later about specific people and relations. Thank you for that. I will go back to the uh, volume and read it through that particular lens. Um, the next question I have for Paul, and this in large part has to do with the introduction that you wrote to the, um, to the volume of, of his work, Stuart Hall's work. And the introduction is called Race is the Prism. And if, um, I hope you don't mind, I wanted to quote um, a couple lines. If we can speak about that quotation, that would be wonderful. You write, racism is not another layer of misery to be logged and added to the dismal effects of other social processes. It has a constitutive power. It shapes and determines economic and political relations. We can learn to look at history, culture, economic and social relations through the frame it affords us. Now, I completely stopped dead in my tracks when I read that line, because it seems in some way that you're suggesting um, that Stuart Hall wouldn't find Kimberly Crenshaw's work on intersectionality convincing or, um, I don't know if important, but maybe convincing, um, though it has been so key to contemporary feminist theory and black feminist um, theory in particular. Am I misunderstanding or do I understand you correctly that perhaps Hall had a kind of hierarchy uh, of sorts, he viewed race as the only prison, as having a more forceful constitutive power um, and framing than say if it were to, you know, intersect with gender, right? Or class in co-determining certain e unequal human relations. So I hope you don't mind commenting on this interpretation or my misinterpretation. Well, thank you very much for um, drawing that out there, uh, Kristin. I'm, what can I say about that? Well, I certainly, you know, uh, wasn't intending to say that that was the only thing that could be done. Um, I, and I, I wasn't really speaking, I suppose I was trying to, I was trying to speak in, in the spirit of Stuart, but I, I'll come to that in a moment. Um, because, 
it seems to me that we can occupy and vacate certain, you know, angles or perspectives of, of critical vision. So I was just simply saying that it was possible um, and that these essays seem to me to offer the invitation to use um, engagement, um, a political engagement, antipathy towards the effects of racial hierarchy and patterns of racialization to, to, to create a kind of... Um, um, a, pro a project in the in the field of thought. Um, now, I, you're right. I did say that racism wasn't another layer of misery to be logged or added to other dismal effects of other uh, other dismal effects of other social processes. And I think Stuart and I, you know, I humbly, um, you know, uh, connect myself to him in this very limited way. Is is that w both of us are very careful about the words that we use um, when we write. And um, I suppose I would say, I certainly didn't, I didn't talk about Kim Crenshaw, I didn't talk about uh, intersectionality, because it seems to me that this work speaks to a world of theory, you know, which he understood to be wrestling with angels or whatever, a world of theory in which the idea of intersecting forms of power and insubordination and violence and control and struggle um, was a commonplace before Kim Crenshaw came along and um, made her version of it something which speaks to a number of particular problems in the operation of US legal reasoning. So I don't, I don't see that as a, a break point or watershed. I think the language of intersectionality, uh, of, of the intersectional, sorry, was a very commonplace language to speak about the accretive aspects of different forms of power and subordination, their mutual resonance and so on. In the context of into which much of this work was written, it was very, it was uncommon, it was very common, sorry, to hear feminist thinkers talk about double and, and, and triple oppression. You know? So there's, there's a sense of complex, um, complex uh, problems, complex patterns of subordination. Now, when I think of the intersection I think of things in one plane, they intersect with one another or they don't. Um, and I don't think that's multimodal myself. That, and, and again, to, to have that conversation, to think it through to the end, involves turning away from this book, which I, I don't really want to do. So let me say then that I think, and there is material in this book to substantiate it, that the sorts of things that are at stake in perhaps a, a more generous and less critical version of reading Kim Crenshaw than the one I want to practice, would be to turn around the concept of articulation. And that is what Hall does. And that is a big, I think, theoretical gain in this book, which, which speaks about, um, about how these systems touch and inform and guide and transform one another. And yet is not so, as it were, amenable to the vulgarization that's led Kim Crenshaw herself to say, don't ontologize the question of the intersection. When I, when I worked, um, uh, at one of the universities I worked at, it was not uh, uncommon for the um, um, black women students there to speak of themselves as the intersectional students. They had entirely ontologized the idea that their positionality was an exceptional one. And for me, I think, you know, again, not being paranoid, uh, that, that actually the gift of the intersectional problematic um, is one in which it offers us a set of tools for thinking relations. And I think that the Hall's theory of articulation does something similar or comparable, although its sources are actually rather different. And if you read the essay, Race, uh, Society, Structure and Dominance, you'll come across a very famous passage, the passage in, in which Hall uh, builds up to the idea that, um, that race is the modality in which class relations are lived. Um, it's page 239, if anybody wants to check, I won't read it out, because I understand we're under pressure with the um, with time. But I think that sense of a lateral plane where things intersect in one, in, one, in one relief is actually rather different to the theory of articulation. And for me, my understanding of Hall's approach to articulation is one which really comes out of his critique of Marxism and his attempt to manage the sort of metamorphosis of a certain sort of set of Althusserian uh, theoretical motifs into something bigger and something slightly different. And, and in that version, in the, in the original Althusserian version, which you know was pretty popular in Birmingham for a while let's say um, yeah, one has a, a number of social and um, historical contradictions central centrally I think a contradiction between labor and capital. 
And around that antagonism, around that contradiction, a number of, as it were, supplementary and related antagonisms and contradictions are also um, formed. And Hall would say they become articulated together in a certain specific historical setting. And so around that central antagonism between uh, capital and labor, which actually might not be so central, it could be dominant without being um, uh, central, it could be dominant because it was a residual thing that had come from the past, or dominant because it was in an emergent form, just because it's central doesn't make it dominant. There, are, There's some complexities and shades in the way that's thought through. Um, around that central contradiction, let's call it that, between capital and labour, you might find a, a gender antagonisms, you would certainly find racialized antagonisms, and they are connected together in a kind of ensemble of relations that that piece, race and societies, structured in domination tries to kind of tease out. And there, I think, is an interesting note also sounded because it's, it's one which says, you know what, Marxism really can't fix this problem. <laughs> uh, that Marxism has to be, as far as I want to put it, stretched, attenuated, uh, pulled apart, teased out, you know, in order to be adequate to speak to the dimensions of the problem that's being tuned into here. So I, I see the theory of articulation in its first iteration as being one that really carries the, the fruits of, the, of, the, of a kind of rupture with certain forms of structural Marxist thinking. I know that there are later versions of articulation which lend, um, which, which lean more heavily on, on, on a sort of, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm trying not to say anything critical or, or difficult. Um, what some might think of as a, as a very particular um, sort of appropriation of certain motifs from Lacan, certain motifs from um, uh, a, a certain kind of set of psychoanalytic themes and perspectives, which are very important to Hall in, a, in the next iteration of the work, but, but which are, you know, sometimes rather, un, if you like, under-theorized um, in the writings that, that precede his readings of artistic and cultural intervention. Thank you for that. So uh, if you don't mind, uh, I'm uh, also today doubling as a sort of a secret uh, sales agent for, for Duke University Press. Uh, then this particular volume that we're discussing today is in fact part of a, a really to my mind fantastic series uh, entitled The Selected Writings of uh, Stuart Hall. And with reference to uh, what, what Professor Gilroy just said now, there is also in fact a sort of companion volume of sorts uh, about precisely about uh, the late Stuart Hall's uh, ambiguous um, relation with, with uh, Marxism entitled Se Selected Writings on Marxism, which comes with a fine um, introduction by uh, Professor Gregor McLennan of uh, Bristol University. Uh, and this volume, of course, uh, includes the uh, really famous uh, and, and classic Hall essay, Marxism Without Guarantees. Uh, but anyway, um, that was my uh, small nudge towards uh, receiving a free copy of the next volume in the series from Duke University Press. I now turn uh, the microphone again to uh, Louisa Olufsen uh, Lane. Yes. Um, yeah, it's a question for Professor Gilroy. That's um, like you mentioned that Stuart Hall is a writer that like many of the articles in the collection are very relevant to discussions that people are having today about culture, about migration, about technology, about multiculturalism. Uh, and in your introduction, you write that, which I think we all agree, that there are many lessons to be learned from Stuart Hall's, can you say, attitude, style, but also, you know, his actual opinions and what he writes. And you, at least that's how I read it. You touch upon potential generational differences between uh, the perspective that Stuart Hall wrote from uh, in relation to kind of modern, modern social media anti-racism. So 
I thought that was interesting. Uh, and you kind of, or if I read it correctly, you sort of imply that Stuart Hall could be a pot potential kind of corrective to some of the more, uh, yeah, potentially negative or problematic tendencies that can be observed in some of this social media culture, especially in, in regards to uh, anti-racism. And at one point you say that, or you kind of imply, if I read you correctly, that that there's some uh, there's that there's a seduction that the seduction of narcissism and nihilism is a potential potential threat. And I was just curious uh, if you could say a little bit more about how you think this kind of slight some of these narcissistic tendencies or nihilistic tendencies manifest themselves in contemporary culture and why you think it's potentially counterproductive. Well, thank you very much for that question. But I, have to say, I think it's really a question for another day, because I, I don't want to uh, really talk about my ideas at all, actually. And I, I, I think it's kind of, um, it's so much more important to think about Stuart Hall's ideas uh, than it is. If people take exception to my sort of ham-fisted attempt to focus this work so that it might speak to contemporary circumstances, I would just beg them really to set that aside and forget it, skip the introduction, put a paperclip over it and just get straight into the, the um, you know, the substance of, of Hall's arguments. I don't, I don't know that, you know, I'm not being very original when I talk about the danger of narcissism and or the danger of nihilism, you know, one of them's got, you know, a century and a half's worth of uh, debate behind it. And the other one's got, you know, just a, a mere century uh, behind it. So these are not, these are not my innovations. I think there is, you know, also, as you know, a, a massive literature about the um, as it were, disempowering elements of engagement with social media and the forms of fantasy, the forms of substitutionism, the forms of, um, you know, um, a peculiar dopamine fueled investment in the idea that clicking on things makes them happen. Um, that, that are really, really, you know, worthy of a, a much more detailed and serious kind of conversation than the one we're able to kind of squeeze into this. I can't, I can't really speculate about how Stuart would have, um, would have thought about those questions either, because it was really just, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it a threat to anti-racism. I mean, we've just seen a massive global movement that is in part fueled by the possibilities that um, social media creates for people. It's not the only thing because there's a great deal of political work at, you know, street level, if I can bring that concept in, you know, all over the place that creates the preconditions, the kind of political ecology in which the, um, you know, linking things via hashtags or mobilizing people via the, um, you know, platform capitalism and surveillance capital, the tools of, that fall our way from that kind of quarter. Um, there's a lot of other, as it were, preparatory work and complementary and parapolitical work that makes those things possible. So I don't, I don't certainly see what's happened in terms of the anti-racist eruption worldwide following the killing of George Floyd, that these things are just the creatures of social media. I, do, I don't buy that interpretation of what they are. Social media enters that story at a certain point. And I'd like to say, I suppose, in you know, honest response to you, that, that the dangers of nihilism and narcissism are things that, that actually might turn people away from what's really exciting and fundamental about the achievements of last summer. So, I, I, you know, it's easy to say, well, get it, it helps to get people into the streets, but can we keep them there? I suppose I'd, I'd want to say that, but the thing that will keep them there is not TikTok only, you know, we can't rely on that. Yeah, use TikTok, use whatever tool you can find, you know, if, if it makes sense to you to do that. And that's the, that's the ticket, the entry ticket to an intergenerational conversation, well, fair enough. But I, I'm a skeptic. Um, I'm a skeptic for my own reasons, and I think Stuart was a skeptic for his for his reasons. Um, and we'll see. It won't take long for us to know, um, you know, whether we can rely on the uh, disjunctive byproducts of narcissism and nihilism to galvanise the anti-racist movement into some new um, um, pitch of uh, of activity. <laughs> Uh, Professor Gilmore also had a hand raised. Did you want to say something? No. Okay. 
So uh, then I take the liberty of uh, posing uh, a question first to Professor Gilmore. Uh, now, as I mentioned in my introduction to this Zoom webinar, in a 1992 tribute to his friend, uh, the Caribbean intellectual giant, uh, C.L.R. James, entitled C.L.R. James, a portrait, and included in your fine volume, Paul writes the following. Major intellectual and political figures are not honored simply by celebration. Honor is accorded by taking his or her ideas seriously and debating them, extending them, quarreling with them, and making them live again. Uh, now, my humble guess is that a part of, of Hall's work on race and difference that has been of particular interest to you uh, as a prominent prison abolitionist and anti-racist scholar uh, is how his work on a little so-called little Englander nationalism and its attendant racism was bound up with uh, very racialized imaginaries that connected young black males in particular uh, to the specter of criminality and violence. An essay like Hall's 1974, Black Men, White Media, included in this volume would, it seems to me, easily and with advantage have uh, been included on the curriculum for any prospective media reporter these days, whether in, in the US, in the UK, or in, in, in my native Nor Norway. And so in the spirit of Paul's remarks about how to honor major intellectual figures, I wanted you to tease out for us in what specific ways uh, Paul's writings on these topics speaks to the present conjuncture in the US in particular, and uh, to your own work on prison abolition in the US. All right, thank you for that question. Um, like um, Professor Gilroy, I came to this webinar to talk about Stuart Hall, not me. Um, and I have, I think twice now, waved this book at the camera to um, remind people or to tell people who didn't know yet that this volume, which was published in 1978, that Stuart Hall co-wrote with um, Charles, Charles Chris Crichter, excuse me, Terry, Tony Jefferson, John Clark, and Brian Roberts, was the model for the book I wrote, even though the book I wrote, Golden Gulag, is wholly different from this one. But the, the kind of expansive brain busting thinking is um, in Golden Gulag. So to um, take up your question uh, concerning now, the first thing I need to say again is that abolition requires that we change everything, everything, everything. So in the US today, um, one of the um, uh, delusions that people struggle under is that mass incarceration is something that happens only or almost only to black people um, for the purpose of exploiting the labor of black people. None of that is true. It happens uh, a lot to black people, a lot to red people, a lot to yellow people, a lot to white people. It happens to people who check the two gender gender boxes and it happens to people who can't check any of those boxes. It happens to all of those people. Half of the labor force in the United States now has some disqualifying arrest or conviction record, whether or not they've ever been locked up, which has a downward pressure on wages throughout the United States. And that was all true before the pandemic, before the pandemic. So the people who have this disqualifying documentation, I call them documented not to work, are the people who do the dirty, difficult, and dangerous work that keeps um, uh, global capitalists like Amazon able to make $10,000 a minute, or is it a second? I don't know. I mean, I'm actually probably one of the least reconstructed Marxists of, you know, the entire planet when it comes to thinking these things, but I must think them through articulation as um, Paul Gilroy laid out. So what does Hall's work make me have to do. The first thing is it makes me have to give up the confusion between cause and effect. Too many people declaim the effects and act as though they're causes. 
They, you know, start with death, which is effect, as though that were cause. Now, in the United States, as well as in France and elsewhere, they, whoever they are, can lock us up because they can kill us, not the other way around. They can't kill us because they can lock us up. They can lock us up because they can kill us. It's very, you know, cause effect. It's really quite different. It's the first thing. The second thing has to do with um, the tendency to declaim things. And I feel like maybe surrounding our conversation today and in the minds of people who are watching now with or without their pens out or their laptops open is this. Some people I fear are trying to decide based on this book and this webinar or the other books in the series that Duke has put out, whether or not they're going to become loyal to somebody called Stuart Hall, as though the intellectual activity of theorizing our way through the conjuncture is one that has to do with loyalty and the ability to declaim certain phrases or concepts from the people to whom we are loyal. This to me is a waste of effort because what it does is it reinforces something that is really common in the social media world that I observe. So I'm not in Twitter, but I lurk there. I see what other people are doing. I'm not a participant in Twitter. And, and that is that people think, as far as I can tell from what they do, that reciting something is the political analysis that's needed. That it's a matter of recitation, whether it's reciting something that Hollis said or something Gilroy said or Kimberly Crenshaw said or Yusindra Bonsado said that, that it's a matter of recitation rather than to go back to those angels we're supposed to be fighting, to go back to them, rather than working through, working through the ideas you know, the, the phrase and what that phrase came from, which is what, again, Stuart Hall has done in every engagement that I have encountered of his, that's been written or recorded for his long, 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 long career, right? Is to work it through and maybe stumble, but get to an end so that you can go on the next day. So we can go on the next day. So the difference between reciting and what I call as an unreconstructed actor rehearsing is absolutely essential. What we can do is rehearse what Stuart does. So that doesn't mean repeat. It doesn't mean recite. It means um, open out in a kind of Brechtian way what the model that we encounter in these um, in this work can do as we fight against militarism, the carceral racism, the destruction of the environment that uh, is both uh, caused by, for example, US militarism, and then US militarism compounds that causing by uh, having policies that target people who are climate refugees for you know, further rounds of US militarism, same with the UK, right? which might be good for you know, Norwegian oil sales, but otherwise not so good for the world. So that might not um, satisfy a question that says, what about mass incarceration in the United States? But as far as I'm concerned, the only way for us to get to the end of that is to change everything. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of people and organizations on the ground in the US and elsewhere who are doing work that as Professor Gilroy suggested, um, uh, coalesced and you know, erupted in the wake of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and all the other mur murders that happened last year in the long hot summer of 2020. So if, if I may say so, uh, Professor Gilmore, that was excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, my last question goes to uh, Professor Gilroy. Um, there are, of course, or there were, of course, many intellectuals, not the least in the Black Ad Atlantic tradition that you yourself so deftly analyzed in your seminal uh, 
the Black Atlantic Modernity and Double Consciousness from 1993, who profoundly influenced uh, Stuart Hall's thought on race and difference. It seems to me, however, that we relatively rarely discuss Hall's thought in relation to the thought of Franz Fanon. Uh, now included in your fine edited volume is Hall's 1996 essay, Why Fanon? And here Hall rightly notes that the, uh, notes that the quote unquote, uh, the struggle to colonize Fanon's work has been an ongoing process from the moment of his death and proposes that instead of trying to recapture the true Fanon, we must try to en engage the afterlife of Franz Fanon and thereby, quote unquote, bring out the enigma of Fanon flashing up before us at a moment of danger. And the, here is, of course, paraphrasing uh, the great Walter Benjamin. Um, Hall's intervention here has a, a, what I would describe as a multi-pronged direction, directionality. It is directed at reductive interpretations of Fanon's work, both left and right, and against those who would regard Fanon as nothing but an incendiary third worldist, which is you know, the, the common right reductionist version of Fanon, or a, a Marxist political activist rather than a theorist, which is sort of the left reductionist version of Fanon. Uh, I, I myself must admit to having some reservations concerning Hall's placing of Fanon's 1952 Black Skins, White Masks, which occasioned this particular essay from 19, uh, uh, 1996, um, as a text which, in Hall's view, anticipates post-structuralism. Uh, to my mind, this is a reading which gestures towards Homo Homibaba's post-structuralist colonization, if you like, of Fanon, and his argument, and this is Hall's argument, that it is not racism as a general phenomenon, but racism in the colonial relation which he, in other words, Fanon, dissects. And so I would like you to elaborate on what you see as the most significant traces of the quote unquote working with Fanon and the quote unquote afterlife of Fanon in Hall's own thinking on race and difference. And I realize that this is, you know, a monumental question, right? <laughs> It is an impossible question to answer, uh, Sindra, but there are a couple of things that one can uh, immediately say, and that, as you rightly intuit, you know, this particular essay was one that came out of a certain context. And I remember the day that um, Stuart gave this talk in the ICA, and it was a day where um, um, Homie and myself and, um, and uh, Bell Hooks had, were also speaking about Fanon, and it's um, it's a text that really speaks to a certain, I would say, critical moment in the um, um, in the um, reignition of interest in 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 Fanon's work, uh, and that the context for it was really an argument about art um, and the visual, um, the gaze, the look. Um, the process of looking, if you like, the, the politics of, of looking. And, and you, if you want to see what this translates into in terms of Stuart's own thinking, you have to look at the number of other essays he wrote that we haven't included here. I don't know whether they're all in the, the famous bibliography, which is there. Some, it's a bit patchy, the bibliography. Um, uh, this is, um, you know, material that appeared in journals like the Photography Journal um, 10.8, um, a number of special issues of which Stuart was involved in um, editing in conjunction often with younger artists and curators, people like David A. Bailey um, and 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 Co Coburn and Mercer and others who were part of that sort of generation. So, so first of all, the, the context is art. Secondly, there's a, a particular kind of generational conversation um, often articulated around questions of sexuality and visual pleasure. Um, this is also, you know, um, within the larger uh, sort of social and political framework, a moment where the right in its, you know, um, in the American context is, you know, banning people from going to exhibitions of Robert Mapplethorpe's photographs and things like that, which were judged to be um, important by many people in the larger politics of 
representing race and sexuality. So I think I think that's that's some of where this comes from. Um, the problem, of course, with, with Fanon, which which this piece does engage, is a very, very familiar problem in the big man syndrome of thinking about ideas and politics. You know, I mean, I can give you an, another example. You know, you, you go to read about Du Bois and, you know, Arnold Rampersad writes his Du Bois and, you know, uh, Manning Marable writes his and then Adolf Reed says that um, Du Bois is really a Fabian, you know, and so then you have a Fabian one. And all these big men commenting on the even bigger man, they write their version of that life in the image of their own obsessions. And I think there's a kind of muted critique of that model here in the sense that, you know, I know Stuart was very um, engaged with in some ways must must have been influenced by Homi Baba's attempt to um, make um, Fanon into some sort of Lacanian. I was never so convinced of that. Um, and in the same moment, you've got, you know, Cedric Robinson's den denunciation of black skin, white masks and its petty bourgeois stink, which I think this piece quotes. And then you've got uh, Henry Louis Gates also, you know, um, projecting a version of Fanon that fits with his particular interests. And, you know, it's a common syndrome. We, what we really don't want is for that time to Stuart, actually. We want to rescue him from those abiding patterns um, that attend the reconstruction of the history of ideas around the figure of a figure of great men, which I think he would have found, uh, you know, rebarbative. So uh, is what else really comes out of this? No, I think I think the most useful and the most enduring legacy of this is is something that we we can tune into by looking at the work of the artists, the younger generation of artists and writers and curators like Mercer, like Isaac Julian, who's another close collaborator of all. Um, let's look at the work that, that they made um, through the kind of portal that Stuart's intervention in the um, circulation of Fanon's ideas created. And, and, and a good place to begin that conversation would really be with, with, with um, Isaac Julian's um, film on Fanon, which, which features Stuart as, a, uh, as a, a significant voice and Francoise Vergès and a number of other uh, notorious, the usual suspects, let's say, from this moment of the, of the movement are all really intersecting, if I can borrow that word, um, in, in the text of, of Julian's film about Fanon. And, and I think that's where I begin to look to answer your question, in the field of um, a, a visual, visual cultures where this, these arguments added up to something very, very specific and, and which has endured because those, that work is still used, it's still alive, it's still uh, resonating, it's still reverberating. Ruthie? That was beautiful. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, if you don't mind, it seems to me that we we will go slightly over time this time as uh, as well. We have uh, so far 23 questions. Uh, there's no way. <laughs> <laughs> and, and rest assured, uh, Professor Gilmore, we're, we're not going by 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 any chance uh, going to get through all of those questions. But I'm uh, uh, and and with the due apologies to our uh, many highly qualified attendees uh, who have posed a number of interesting questions here for uh, Professor Gilmore and, and Gilroy. Uh, I'm I'm going to have to pick up out uh, a, a few questions. Uh, and in selecting these questions, I've tried to uh, get to some of the questions that uh, speak to uh, other questions uh, uh, and issues raised uh, by, uh, by attendees. Um, so if I, let me see, uh, if I can scroll to the start here. So we start out with a question from uh, Bruce Barnett. Uh, it is so moving to hear you both speak about Stuart Hall. If I could, I would like to ask a question about high culture. My sense of Stuart Hall is that his, his work push, pushes us to think primarily about popular culture, but how does his approach help us think about innovative or radical cultural texts that aren't necessarily popular? 
I'm thinking here particularly about the work of authors like Nathaniel Mackey and Marlon James. In other words, writers whose works seem like intimations of radically other social forms, but who don't write in a popular idiom. And either one of, of you, of course, can volunteer to answer that, uh, Professor Barnard's question. I, I don't, I mean, yes, what would, um, how would one make the work and its sense of the field of culture speak to, you know, the place of, in this case, you know, African American and Caribbean uh, literary habits in a, in a sort of modernist frame? I guess that's the an answer, isn't it? It's really, to me, I'm, I'm hearing a question about, about modernist form. And um, I don't, I don't know how would I guess that's where I'd say I'd say that there are there are a number of questions about about modernism and form, but I never heard. I mean, and maybe you know, I'm I can't, I'm not the right person to even think about this in the context of Stuart Hall's work, because although I know that he was a voracious reader of fiction, I never really heard, I never heard him speak on these things, and it's not somebody who, as far as I know, wrote. Um, wrote uh you know criticism or something like that i mean there's a little bit of i suppose of the answer that speaks to his um occasional commentary on music which i think became very more much more important to him uh, after he became um unwell and uh, the flavor of that is kind of conveyed in um is kind of conveyed in some of the um, visual material that John Acumfra and his associates produced to narrate Stuart's life. Um, but I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, about Nathaniel uh, Nate Mackey's poetry or or that original Bedouin Horn book. You know, I can't kind of imagine. I can't put the worlds together. I'm afraid. Marlon James, I mean, I'm sure Stuart would have read that uh, and and found it interesting. But I, I, I suppose for me, the problem about those items in their transition into a kind of modernist culture of reading will be that they would be, I guess I would say, fettered by a kind of... Uh, fettered by a kind of... by the idea that they were exotica of one kind or another. And, and I guess I don't... I think in Stuart's... Uh, Hall's kind of readings of, of 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 cultural process and and of cultural um, objects. I I don't see any room for exotica. So I suppose that's where I'd go. I try and I try and say, you know, what is it about these m formerly modernist experiments in poetry and literature, um, which are part of a, a broader intellectual account of the life of, you know, Black Atlantic. Um, intellectuals in a kind of 20th, well, actually slightly longer than 20th century uh, history, the long 20th century, that 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 would have to redeem, would have to redeem them from from the kind of tarnish that they are, that they're really exotic items in a in in a kind of um, cultural ecology of a of a certain sort. Where, as we know, and I think Louisa Lane um, alluded to this earlier on, the question of sort of negrophilia and negrophobia become kind of meshed with each other in ways that are actually detrimental to the larger interests of, of real living black people. Uh, then there is a question from uh, one Jose David Salidiva, uh, who asked what might Stuart Hall have thought about pessimism? as a luxury? Uh, Jose, how are you? Um, you know, you know the answer to that question. So you put it out here um, just, just to be provocative. Um, it's a luxury that I think most of us can ill afford. But I want to say something related to that. Um, and that is to say, uh, in part, in partial response to the earlier question about, about Nate Mackey and, and, and Marlon James and so forth, that if, if the vivid compositions that we've accumulated in this volume 
um, are in one way or another understood as social theory. And if social theory is a guide to action, it means also that this writing um, or this speech put down on paper model methodologies. And methodology is kind of a, a hot word these days in a whole lot of the world. And I think that's not a bad thing. I think it's a good thing that people are stopping to think about what it is uh, theoretically, what I, ideas and understandings of the world guide um, the sequence of actions that might produce evidence and evidence to produce arguments uh, that give answers that are actionable. So the MST, uh, the Landless Workers uh, Movement in Brazil, has many methodologies. So it's not something that's only confined to you know, university social scientific life. And it's also true that uh, in the world of uh, the kind of humanities, arts and humanities um, uh, wing of, of cultural production, uh, more and more people I encounter talk about methodology. You know, it's just one of those words. So um, in, insofar as in the social world, uh, actions belie themselves, um, then one of the sort of key things that I have learned from learning with Stuart Hall over the years is um, how to be in conversation with people. And I'm not always good at it, but I do know the right thing to do, but my manners often elude my, me. So, um, in, in that reading group I told you about at the beginning of our, of our convocation today, um, I, as I said, we were reading all different kinds of things, you know, trying to refresh ourselves to get a sort of new sense in 1989, not long before the Berlin Wall came down of what is to be done. And um, one of the things we realized in the context of reading and grappling with Stuart Hall's work was that we had gotten into the habit of not listening when we weren't speaking, but rather as uh, Alan Eladio Gomez put it so beautifully some years ago, our idea of was if we weren't speaking, we were just waiting. Like it's the other side of waiting. So I, I held up waiting in, in the uh, CLR James case, but there's also bad waiting, which I think is related to um, pessimism. Uh, and that is to say, it's got a nihilistic side to it that seems to um, uh, encourage passivity, even if there's a lot of thought at the, in the context of passivity. So uh, we had to learn that when we weren't speaking, we were supposed to be doing something else. And part of that, of course, is listening. But the the methodology that we you know, began to sort of lift up from and uh, rehearse from Stuart Hall's work uh, gave us, who were mostly organizers, who didn't have day jobs that let us you know, read all day, um, uh, gave us the opportunity to be more attentive to, or what we might say, notice things about whatever we were encountering. It didn't make us brilliant, it just made us more attentive. And that attention is what matters in my view. Being able to be attentive is perhaps the greatest gift that I can brag of that Stuart Hall gave me even if he didn't realize, he gave it to me, that this meant being attentive. And that this attentiveness, um, enables us to notice the inconsistencies, which is really profoundly important, the inconsistencies between experience and consciousness or scale and struggle, you know, both. And that this then let us rework questions so that the question about, you know, high culture, I thought, well, wasn't Robert, Robert Mathelthorpe officially high culture? I think he was, I mean, it's really expensive. So that must make, you know, that work high culture. Um, and that is completely different from what we had come to our reading group doing. And that is that we had tended to 
conform to a sound and style of political engagement that was bombarded all the time by poisons and sweets, and that for us generally resolved as rage. And rage and pessimism are very, very near neighbors. So thank you for that question, Jose David Saldiva. Yeah, I'd just like to say one thing more to that, which is that the problem with most of the so-called pessimism that circulates these days is that it gives pessimism a bad name. And actually what it really is, is a kind of fatalism. And I'd want to draw a distinction, a sharp distinction between pessimism and fatalism. And I think that, that Stuart Hall's work, you know, which is mostly content to situate itself in a kind of dialectical, I don't believe in this for myself, I'm just saying, Stu, this is what I think Stuart's doing, is he's quite happy to operate in a kind of dialectical ecology um, derived from the Gramsci and, and the, well, I can't remember who it was who said it before Gramsci, of the pessimism of the intellect and the optimism of the will. He's comfortable in that way of thinking about things. And, uh, and, and, and you know, it, it, maybe it's the last dialectic for him, that particular one. Um, that's not my terrain and my territory. And I, and I would, for me, I think the distinction that we have to draw is between fatalism and pessimism. I think it's it's sensible to be pessimistic at the moment. And there are lots of interesting uh, resources that are, um, which don't render you inert, actually, in in, in accommodating that, that pessimism. Um, but that, that's another conversation for another day. So for me, pessimism, uh, that that's, if you like, hashtag pessimism, is, is one which really is not pessimism at all. It's, it's a kind of fatality. And, and of course, we know from things that Ruthie said already today, that that fatality is part of the politics of struggling against racial orders and transforming them. But to be overwhelmed by that fatality is, is, is a disaster for, for all sorts of other reasons. So we also, <laughs> we also have a question from an attendee by the name of Andy. Um, who asks, uh, the following question, the difficulties Hall faced in connecting his thinking on race with collective action. Uh, and the reference here is, of course, to the tensions between Stuart Hall, uh, which I believe also uh, Paul is familiar with, between Stuart Hall and uh, the organizer Sivanandan and the Institute for Race Relations. Uh, so Andy's question is basically, what can we learn from those conversations around counter-racist theory and collective action today? Um, nothing. I don't think there's anything really to learn. I suppose you learn about the pitfalls of ultra sectarianism and what the young, the youth them call virtue signaling. I think that's an, another issue. I mean, there are some, you know, there are some political questions involved which are pending in the, the legacy of, uh, of both of these um, important contributors to the political life of black people in, in our country and beyond, you know. Um, do we gain anything from seeing them in conflict? Not really. If you if you want to try to settle that particular question, then don't look at um, Stephen, Stephen, Stephen Anden's rather unkind um, intervention. Look at the look at the rather generous um, for, um, f introduction that Stuart Hall provided to Stephen Anden's. Um, volume of essays, the first volume of essays that were published. So re read those two texts in counterpoint and then we can start to have a, a more productive conversation about it than the sort of celebrity death match kind of approach. Okay, thank you. Um, so going back to the question of, of Hall's uh, ambiguous relationship with, with uh, Marxism again. Uh, and I think this goes a bit beyond, uh, a bit beyond uh, your concrete volume. Uh, but one Vanjiku Vainaina would, would like to know uh, more about Hall's relationship with Marx's position on proletarian internationalism. Uh, did uh, Professor Hall engage with this element of Marx's work? Uh, and in particular, uh, in the question of whether it could 
provide a pragmatic approach for the post-colonial world. Sure. Um, I, Paul, you 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 unmuted yourself, so you had. To I thought ahead. you were going to speak, Ruthie. So I'm not. Um, I think you get a sense of of what's going on in that question from reading Hall's uh, piece of, of writing about C.L.R. James. And C.L.R. James, for me, is the sort of headmaster of proletarian internationalism. You know, the sort of finger wagging, you know, uh, sage of proletarian internationalism. And that, you know, again, it takes us away from this, this, this work into a sort of larger argument about the things that Hall acknowledges in that essay, the, the Forrest Johnson tendency, the effect of 1956 on the international culture of communism, and in, in, in Stuart Hall's own life and writing, something that we couldn't really get into in this, otherwise we'd have had a multi-volume uh, um, book, book really here, not just one. You know, the, the effects on the Communist Party of that, um, of that rupture in the world. I mean, Ruthie's already spoken about um, 1989, the wall coming down, but you know, obviously in Hall's own arc of thinking and um, the sort of leavening of his political intellect really, 1956, which is the invasion of Hungary and the, um, of course, the Suez adventure, both of which have big implications for uh, how we understand the, the political field of proletarian internationalism in the second half of the 20th century. They, they loom they loom very large. I think, you know, I don't believe that Stuart Hall was ever um, a member of the Communist Party. Um, and and he certainly wasn't somebody who was, um, you know, sympathetic to the, um, the, the Fourth International or, or those things, although I think he was open to conversation with individuals from that quarter. So I think the work points in a very different kind of direction overall, and it points through the involvement of things like with things like UNESCO into a into the aftermath of a kind of tricontinentalist political imagination of which you know how that's entangled with the demise of proletarian internationalism uh, um, in the phase of decolonization is a longer conversation but I, I think there are emergent institutions that speak to the, that question and of course the, the history of the Caribbean region speaks directly to that because as black power comes to an end you know you have the revolution in Grenada you have the murder of Walter Rodney and a number of things that we can we can point to of the, that offer a different sort of punctuate different set of punctuation marks and carriage returns in the story of proletarian internationalism as a as a kind of planetary failure um, that, that do help us to to understand the positions that Hall's taking and the, the different forces that he's able to identify. Um, and, you know, policing the crisis has had a certain amount of air um, and attention this afternoon. I think that there are a number of pointers in that book also towards these complexities, um, not least in the final pages of the book where Hall begins to think about, you know, endo-colonialism of, 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 of internal colony areas in which the policing and administration of law and violence and statecraft and government actually owe, uh, owe everything to the uh, innovations and um, uh, perspectives that have emerged from the colony as a kind of laboratory of political culture. So, so I think, you know, um, that for me opens up a different understanding of, of what international or transnationalism might be, of how political ideas and institutions and resources of different kinds emerge from that colonial space, but travel into other places and take on um, a new life, a secondary life in those environments. I, I would, I'd like to expand a little bit on this um, with no disagreement at the moment with my interlocutor and co-editor. And that is um, a, a lesson, a, a key lesson uh, to learn in constant engagement with uh, Stuart Hall's work is to remember that whatever catastrophe um, we might uh, perceive, uh, in, in our study or encounter in our organizing work, 
um, is rife with um, contradictions, which give us the opportunity, no guarantee, to figure something else out. So if proletarian internationalism means to the uh, questioner, um, the Communist Party, that's one thing. If uh, the internationalism of people who are dependent on wages or on the money form to make ends meet, who are being pushed and pulled, whether they stay in one place, uh, criminalized or not, or move somewhere else, then yes, there are all kinds of resonances that are currently, you know, actually existing political organization. As, as Paul said, uh, there's a kind of cons uh, current tricontinentalism that is uh, sort of coming, has been coming back to life uh, very strongly uh, uh, between and among uh, Asia, uh, Latin America and Africa, but also influencing North America and, and, and Europe and probably Antarctica as well and, and Australia. Uh, that's one thing. A second thing is that the solidarities that people are making uh, uh, across uh, borders and boundaries of various kinds are um, enabling people to live, um, uh, whether it's uh, people who are part of land occupations in Durban, who uh, just settled, settled, uh, settled celebrated uh, 10 or maybe it's 15 years um, of, of uh, a, a community there that is in solidarity with MST and you know working on on various kinds of agrarian uh, connections across the South Atlantic. I mean, these things are happening, and if we don't want to call it in proletarian internationalism, fine. But perhaps we could, you know, kind of rework the concept, uh, bust it through as well as out of already existing parties and party formations so that we can understand that the um, recitation of catastrophe is, uh, as I was saying earlier, uh, confusing effects for causes. Uh, and that, that is um, a, a, a key thing for me. And I wanna say one other thing about uh, the final pages of Policing the Crisis that one of the things that Hall and his colleagues thought about a bit uh, as well was how you know, an entire um, uh, grouping of people who were not ever um, articulated into the formal proletariat are so much the focus of uh, the um, law and order. Right. And, the, and the question then is why? And I talked earlier um, this afternoon about how, you know, in the United States, still the richest economy on the planet, half of the labor force, fully 50% of the labor force has some disqualifying arrest or conviction record that has a downward pressure on their ability to make a living, which is necessary in the United States of America through the medium of money. So we, we can see these, um, these stretches and resonances uh, in ways that I think matter, um, rather than get mired down in, is, is this proletariat that proletariat? So thank you very much. I, I regret to say that we're, we're now uh, approaching the end of, of this uh, really great uh, theory from the margin Zoom webinar. Uh, my sincere apologies to all uh, of the attendees whose chat questions we have not been able to, um, to tackle, uh, but you can trust us that we will convey um, those questions uh, to Professor Gilroy and, and Professor Gilmore off in, in the aftermath of, of, of this. Um, before rounding off, I need to say a few words, um, and it's not that we have any sponsors or advertisers that we uh, are obliged to take into account. <laughs> We're free of charge in all respects. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I, I would like to mention that for those of you who, for some reason, haven't been able to uh, 
uh, follow this either uh, on our Zoom platform or via the Facebook live stream, we will be posting uh, a slightly edited recording of uh, this theory from the margins Zoom webinar uh, on our YouTube uh, channel uh, shortly. Uh, and I'm also obliged to mention that the next theory from the margins Zoom webinar uh, is scheduled to take place in exactly one month uh, on June 13th when we uh, will be discussing Professor uh, at Columbia University, Professor Mahmoud Mamdani's Neither Settler Nor Native, The Making and Unmaking of Permanent uh, Minorities, published this earlier this year by Harvard University uh, Press. Um, I should also mention that if you want to follow updates on our events, uh, you're free to follow uh, our uh, website at uh, www.theoryfromthemargins.com and also our Facebook pages where we regularly post on upcoming events in this uh, series. Uh, I also need to thank uh, our distinguished guests, uh, Professor Ruth Wilson Gilmore and Professor Paul Gilroy for uh, a wonderful uh, Zoom webinar spent with us, uh, and uh, we are at Theory and the Margins uh, very much looking forward uh, to further engagement uh, with both of your works. Um, now, uh, I also thank, need to thank the attendees uh, for their participation and their very fine contribution to making this Theory from the Margin Zoom webinar. Uh, such a great experience for all of us. Uh, I should have mentioned at the very beginning that uh, it's a special day for uh, some of those uh, that a theory from the margins uh, tried to address themselves to. It so happened that we you know, are having this uh, uh, Zoom webinar on the very day of Eid and Pe Pentecost. Uh, which today, uh, or this year at least here in Norway, coincides. Uh, we apologize for any offense caused by uh, our ha having and hosting this theory from the Margin Zoom webinar on this very day, uh, but hope to, uh, to have your participation in the next Zoom web webinar. And we should also then uh, like to um, wish you all Eid Mubarak. Uh, and on that note, uh, I think it's also fitting for me <laughs> uh, to say, with regard to the volume that we've been discussing today, Stuart Hall, Selected Writings on Race and Difference, uh, one of the, the, the shortest Arabic terms, which is simply ikra, meaning read. Thank you very much. And whatever else you do, have a wonderful day. We hope to see you all again. Thank you very much.